Uh, avoid legal snags by telling people they're being recorded. You are being recorded, Steve. Yeah, it's just popped up on my screen. He was <laughs> recording the call. <laughs> so, uh, you can uh, subject to swearing. You can say whatever you, whatever you want. I've had I had one guest on, and he was calling the French cheese eating surrender monkeys, which is arguably worse than swearing. Uh, well, mm. if you're a French person. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I guess, yeah. This is crazy. How are you? Yeah, mate, I'm all right, yeah. I'm uh, I'm not long actually back from a ride. I was out uh, merrily riding my bike round and then an alarm went off on my phone to say, you got a podcast, podcast with Hugh in an hour? And I was like, oh dear, I'm at least half an hour away from home. So, uh, yeah, I had to uh, hightail it back home. So, uh, yeah, when you messaged to say it would uh, be about 10 minutes late, I was like, oh, that's fine, mate, that's all good. So, uh, happy <laughs> I, uh, days. I am- I envy people in the sticks at the moment with this lockdown. Like my parents live in, in uh, a valley in South Wales. You're obviously up in Scotland with, the, the, I'm assuming, next to mountains. No, mate, I'm, I'm, I live in Hebden Bridge now. So, um, yeah, so I'm kind of just north. Hebden Bridge, just between kind of Manchester and uh, Halifax. Oh, why do I think Scotland? I've, I'm having a brain fart. Well, you, I, I did used to live in Scotland. Um I lived in Scotland for 12 years, but since I've been on the British cycling team, I've uh, I had to move closer to the velodrome, but obviously didn't want to live in Manchester. So this is kind of like a a good um, yeah exactly. So this is like a good halfway house. So well, the velodrome is obviously in Manchester, and my pilot Adam, who I ride with, lives in Leeds. So I'm kind of halfway between the two, so it works out quite well. When I have to go in the velodrome, I can jump on the train or ride in. It's about a two-hour ride. And then, you know, when I'm riding with Adam or racing with Adam, I can jump on the train and get to his in about 45 minutes. So, uh, so yeah, it's quite a, uh, yeah, it's quite a nice spot, really. It's not Scotland, but hey, you know, it's, uh, it's not too bad. Well, what's that feeling like, Steve, where you're not in control of the bike? Someone else's. Because I, I'm, I ask this as someone who rode bikes and the speed they go, road cycling and the speed they go, mate. I like mountain biking. Uh, road biking frightens me because the speed you get up to and the, how t- thin the tyres are, just the margin for error is a lot less. And then the way you have to do it, you have to put all your faith in someone else to point you in the right direction and 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 and, this, and you're going twice as fast. I expect no, well, not twice as fast, but a rate of knots faster. Yeah, it's it's an interesting one. You know, I get um I get asked that a lot, and I think I think there's definitely two kinds of people in the world. There's people who can let go of the controls and right on the back and there's people that definitely can't and Adam is definitely who is my pilot definitely can't ride on the back of a tandem it's just not he just can't do it freaks him out um but you know it's, it's crazy I remember uh we, we had a really bad crash in the in the build-up to the world championships uh in 2015 so the year before the games uh it's the only time we've ever crashed on the road uh we're coming down to the sand um and we had a double puncture doing about 50 mile an hour so oh we, uh, yeah, we we hit the deck and it wasn't it wasn't too pretty, but the bike was pretty trash. And so were we, but you know it was it wasn't too bad. But three weeks later, we were racing in Switzerland at the World Championships, and the it was literally the course went round the bottom of the hill, up to the top of the hill, and then back down the other side of the hill, like almost like a triangle around this mountain. And I remember when we when they closed the course for training. Uh, we got up to the uh, got up to the top of this climb, which was absolutely horrific. And then we started descending, and we hit about seventy mile an hour, I think, on the descent. And obviously, when I'm tucked in behind Adam, I can't I can't see anything. Um, you know, I can't I can't see the you know very well at the best of times. But certainly with my head stuck right behind his backside, I really can't see a thing. And I was, as we're descending, and I could, you know you can feel the you can feel the speed build and the and the wind start to get in your ear. It's, you know, it's pretty exhilarating. I kind of had this thought where I was thinking, I don't know, I don't actually know what's worse, being on the back out of control or being the guy on the front who is in control. You know, and it's, it's a very, it's a very funny thing, you know, it's like on the back, I, you know, I've, I've got my job to do, which is think, think light as a feather and don't, don't move on the bike, you know, keep my weight central, no rash movements, you know, don't look around or take pictures or any of that sort of thing. But then, you know, on the front of the bike, I've got all my trust in Adam, but, Adam's got the responsibility to get us both down the hill as fast as possible, as safe as possible. You know, so he's his job is far, far harder, I think, than mine sat on the back. Um, yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's interesting. I think the very first time I rode with Adam, 
um, when we first met, and I think about, I think it was January 2014, and we got on the tandem and rode. I mean, Adam's a very experienced tandem pilot. I've been riding a tandem with his dad since he was about 13. I've been riding on the front since he was about 14. So, you know, he's had over 15 years of riding on the front of a tandem. And that's, you know, that's not a given. You know, not everyone has that experience. And, you know, he's, I, I knew as soon as I rode with him, he was, you know, he was just like the next level of anyone else I'd ever ridden with. Um, and yeah, and, you know, like he's, he's sort of ridden with ever since. And, you know, we, we have a great laugh doing it. And it's, um, yeah, good crack. But, you know, the thing is, when we, when we have crashed, which is only the once, he came off a lot worse than what I did because um, I landed on top of him. So, uh, you know, think about you've, you've got all that. Uh, yeah, I've got no control, but I've got a big cushion who sits in front of me. So, um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, not, it's not all bad being out of control, mate, and not being able to see where you go. Because anything he hit, he's going to hit first and then have, you know, 80 kilos of bloke come up behind him pretty quickly. So, yeah, it's interesting. But thankfully, touch wood, mate, we, uh, we, don't, we don't crash too often, which is a bonus. <laughs> you said it now, mate. You've ruined it. Ruined it. Well, but is yeah, the, um, yeah. is is uh is Tokyo on this year or not? No, mate. No, it's been postponed. So uh, yeah, they pushed it back a year. So it's now pushed back to the twenty fourth of August next year, uh, twenty twenty one. Still going to be are called the Tokyo twenty twenty games. Um, oh so, yeah. Are you are you yeah. competing? Well, we'll see, mate. It's not. It's not. You know, they've announced a date, but they haven't said whether or not it's, it's actually going to go ahead. I think there's still a bit of chat around if there's a vaccination for this COVID, and without uh, vaccination, they're kind of. They've sort of said it, it's probably pretty unlikely to go ahead. So, uh, at the moment, mate, I'm. Uh, I'm not sure where my cycling career is. Um, where it's placed. You know, we haven't got any races in the calendar until March next year, and that's back in uh, Rio in Brazil. But I mean, I don't know if you've seen the state of Brazil at the moment, but they're, they're copping this COVID thing pretty bad. So I'm not. What's, be, go, what's going on? I've not seen oh, what's going on right It's just their, uh, the president of Brazil kind of is, is a bit of a, um, I guess he's a bit similar to a Trump character and just kind of went through a bit of a denial process of, you know, this isn't going to affect us. And hey, lo and behold, it's, uh, it's affecting everyone, mate. So um, yeah, it's, it's, it, I've got it pretty bad there at the moment. So I'm not sure... Um, you know, by the time next year comes around, March next year, you know, the, the, the you know, the, the advice will be to travel to South America. Yeah, I'm, I'm not really sure. We'll just have to wait and see. You know, as you know, there's so many things up in the air at the moment. Um, and our, our, our racing calendar isn't, isn't really a priority, which is, you know, which is the right thing. Um, but, you know, when it's when it's what you do and it's your job and it's, uh, it's pretty, pretty frustrating. But hey, ho, there's people, I always say there's, there's people a lot worse off, mate. People are dying in big numbers. So, me not racing isn't the be-all and end-all of the world at the moment. So, uh, yeah, it's just one of those things. Just got to roll with the punches and we'll play it out and see what happens. What's your, what's your training routine when you're like off-season, when you're when you're not building up to a competition? I suppose you're always building up to a competition in some respects. When you're miles off like this, what's your training routine? What do you do? Yeah, well, for Adam and I, because we ride out on the road and we ride the track, you know, that's kind of like a summer and a winter taken care of. So, you know, during the racing, you don't really have, you know, probably have a week during the end of the winter season. So probably a week in like end of March, early April, like completely off the bike. And then we're back on it to build up to the summer. And then, you know, after the summer, we might get a week or two weeks off, depending on how the race schedule falls. Um, you know, I mean, we've had we've had two months off before and we've had no time off before at the end of the summer season, just kind of bounce straight into the straight into the track season. So um, whereas at the moment, it's, uh, you know, there's not a lot going on, really. It's kind of it's a bit weird when, you know, we were only six months away from a game. So we're, you know, building up to, you know, we're both pretty fit at the moment. And go, you know, we're going pretty well. And then all of a sudden, you know, kind of like eight weeks later, you just kind of like, oh, you know, it's nice to have a beer and chill out and eat pizza and not, you know, be normal for a bit, which is, you know, which is nice. But that only lasts for so long because, you know, even though the games are postponed and we've got no racing in the calendar, you know, it's kind of, you know, fitness is always there. And if you let that go too bad, then, you know, the, the hill at the other end of that's too too hard to climb. And, and certainly when you're, you know, when you're pushing 43, it's, um, the hill's getting bigger. So uh, got to stay pretty fit. So yeah, I'm still I'm still riding, mate. I've done a lot on the turbo over this lockdown period, but just starting to get back out on the road. So it's uh, yeah, it's all uh, all fun and games. I suppose part of the difficulty might must be um, 
stay motivated for it you know because for, for, i remember when i was when i was a kid just doing competitions and stuff like that when i was a kid in fact when i was serving for some athletic stuff that i hated training i hated it i hated it but it was the payoff was the competition flipping love competing same rugby i hated uh when i was young i hated rugby training but then the payoff was the game love i love the competition yeah how are you finding that then how are you finding the mental side of it uh, mentally, I've been uh, I've been pretty good, to be honest. Uh, I think I think you know it's starting to get pretty um, pretty full on in terms of you know the, the talk around the team and stuff about the build up, and obviously there's still team selection to go. So you know you kind of you know Adam and I room with a good shout because we've got a good track record, and we've you know we've um, we've we've been on the podium pretty much every race I think since Rio. So you know like we're um, we're a competitive tandem, but uh, but you know they're still. There's, I think there's um, there's eight male spots with I think probably sixteen or seventeen riders going for those spots. So you know it's, it's you know these are your teammates, but it's it's still fiercely competitive. Um, so it's kind of nice to not be back in that you know to turn that off for a bit and not have to be stressing about if you're going to qualify or who's who's the team that's going to be going and all that sort of stuff. Um, so like I say, you know it's it's pretty rare that I get a chance to properly be human, you know, just be normal, just just be a guy who, you know, can have a beer if I want or do, do you know, do kind of what I want. And, you know, most of the time, you know, that's the thing people don't get as an athlete. It's, it's kind of a 24-7 job. You know, every, everything you put in, you know, in, in your mouth kind of makes a difference, whether it's good or bad. And so it's kind of nice just to not have to worry about that and not stand on the scales every day and, you know, not, not stare at a power meter all the time. And, yeah, it's quite quite nice. Talk me through that process um, of the of the build up to the selection. Talk talk about the 26, 2016 one, uh, the twenty sixteen games, and what was that? Was that your first games that you did? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What was that like? What what, what was the pre- What was the pressure like building up that selection? First selection. Um, it was a bit mad, really, because I Adam and I started racing kind of two and a half years before Rio. Um, on, on the on the kind of world stage, and we hadn't really we hadn't really done an awful lot in terms of ha- had an awful lot of success. Um, you know, we, we'd so the, the basis of the, the way the kind of tier system works to give you an idea is you've got the um, Paralympics, of the, obviously the the flagship event, and then you have World Championships, which happen every year, which is for those rainbow bands, those iconic rainbow stripes as a cyclist, uh, and then below that you have a World Cup series, and to qualify for the games you have to score points at World Cups. Um, so, yeah, top 10 places in World Cups give you points. Uh, and it's, you know, whatever it is, three, you maybe have to qualify 350 points over a cycle to uh, qualify your place uh, in the team. So Adam and I were turning up to races and, you know, kind of getting a bit of a kicking, not really getting on the podium. Uh, it was all new. You know, I was brand new to cycling. I was, a, I was I've got a rock climbing background. I wasn't a you know, athlete where Adam Adam's always been a cyclist, a phenomenal cyclist. Um, so it was really hard for me at the start because there was Adam who's already like at an elite level, cy- you know, cyclist. And I'm the guy on the back who j- I just felt like I was letting him down every time we raced because I was rubbish, uh, you know, because I just, I was brand new to everything. Um, so, yeah, so the lead in was, was a bit weird. We started getting on the podium a bit and, you know, we, we won a, a couple of time trial bronze medals and then, you know, sneaked the silver and, and all of a sudden going into kind of 2015 was a bit better and we, you know, we did pretty well. But I mentioned earlier, we bombed out massively. It was, you know, and that was supposed to be like a, the last big road event before the game. So we're pretty, uh, you're pretty bummed after that because we, you know, we got an absolute kicking. And then we went into this. You, you, the, you, you, you broke up then as you were talking about the games. So which games? Is, what happened to that games? All oh, it came back on when you said you were bummed out about it. So I don't know what happened. Oh, so at the at those um, at those worlds in Switzerland, um, you know, we just uh, after we crashed and stuff, and we we, we just oh. we were just miles off where we needed to be. So we kind of came away from that, and that was the last big qualifying event before the games for the road. And you know, we had two events on the road and one on the track, so it was a bit. Um, it was a bit hard to take and I guess at that point we were kind of looking at each other going well is this actually really going to happen you know are we actually going to get to a games or is this just you know not a waste of time but yeah so we, we had a massive winter training 
and we we actually ended up uh, our, we ended up losing our coach. Um, he left the squad, and we had our uh, team's physiologist start coaching us. A guy named Dan Henchy, who still is our coach now, and he he kind of turned it around. Really, he kind of had a good look at both of us, had a good chat to us, and basically said. You know, both you need to pull your finger out. You know, I, I don't think we were doing anything wrong. It was just the way we we're being coached. And he was like, that was too, way too soft. You know, we need, you need to work a lot harder than that. So, and both of us were up for that. Uh, so, yeah, the kind of, we went to the Track World Championships in Monte Carlo in Italy in 2016. And we'd been set a pretty harsh target. Well, a realistic target, not harsh, from uh, British Island to say, you know, listen, you have to ride or you this from your standing start uh the winning time you, uh, in london you, 2012 you, you you broke up again <laughs> it's, oh, it's gonna be one of those conversations isn't it no it's it, mate, it sometimes it goes like it, it should be right but um you were on a, you you were at the point talking about um you've been given a harsh target yeah, so uh, I, I think it was a fair target. It felt harsh at the time. But uh, we, we basically had to achieve this target or else our, our hope or dream of going to the Games was, was a non-starter. Um, so, we, so we went out to Monte Carlo and we actually uh, we went quicker than what we were expecting to, which was absolutely incredible. And, and I thought it was the first chance we were going to get a, uh, a World Championship medal. And we actually uh, we qualified um, third fastest, so the last four riders go into the metal ride-offs. So the fastest two ride for the, the gold and the silver and the and the third and fourth ride for the bronze. And we were racing a Canadian tandem and we were a second quicker than a second quicker than them in, them in qualifying. And, uh, and, the, and they beat us in the final. So we came fourth, which is obviously a really shit place to finish, um, you know, just outside the medals when you're that close. Um, but, but I think that was enough to show the guys at, at, at British Cycling that we were, you know, if we kept working at the rate we were, we could be competitive at the games. Um, and then we went back onto the road after that and we had one World Cup in Belgium, which was the last selection event. And we had to get on the podium there on the time trial. So we got a bronze medal there. We didn't have a great ride, but we got a bronze medal there. Um, so, yeah, and, and, and then it was kind of, yeah, that was, so that was, I think, the end of May. And then we had to wait till the end of June before you before you even know if you got selected. Um, so we had that had that kind of dreaded call from the team manager, and uh, and thankfully for us it was uh, yeah you've got the nod. And then and then literally it went it just went into overdrive training. Like I I, I thought it was hard up until that point, and then it just got ridiculous. You know, it's just I can remember six months out. I can just remember every day getting out of bed and my legs ached. You know, and I, you know, I hadn't had a drink for a year, an alcoholic drink, and you know, I was watching what I was eating, and everything was just so. I just turned into this recluse who never went out, you know, never did anything besides ride my bike or you know, eat and sleep. I just was an absolute zombie. Um, and I remember, like, we go into what's called a holding camp before the games, which is in, in Newport in Wales, next to the track. And so the week before we arrive at, at in Rio, uh, we're two weeks in this holding camp. And I remember arriving at the holding camp and the head coach at the time saying, oh, how are you feeling? And I said, mate, I'm absolutely knackered. You know, I'm absolutely knackered. And, uh, and he said, oh, good, that's exactly where you need to be. Because if you're ab- feeling amazing now, we've got this all wrong. And, you know, we need, you, we need you to be feeling amazing in two weeks' time, not now. So that's good. We've got you exactly where you want you. And, and I think just that kind of bit of chat really changed my perspective on, you know, it's like, all oh, right, okay, yeah, these guys, these guys actually know what they're doing. Not that I didn't think they did, but, you know, everything was about believing in the process. And, uh, yeah, and I think after that, I kind of relaxed. And, you know, that holding camp was super relaxed, which was amazing. We had bomber weather, you know, I mean, Newport, it was hitting 30 degrees. It was outrageous. You know, it was so good. Um, so we were, you know, riding the bikes out on the road and, and during the day. And um, I, th- I think the game changing moment came for Adam and I when we had our race day run through in the Newport Velodrome. And it was the same day that they allowed public to come in and watch our training session. Um, so they were probably, you know, Newport's not a very big velodrome. There are probably, I don't know, a hundred people in there maybe watching, you know, watching us 
fart it around as a as a as a track squad, which you know there's not a lot of action happening when there's just one one team on the track, and you know there's lots of rest and recovery and all this sort of stuff. So people must have been thinking we're a joke. But um, Adam and I got up to do we we basically had a full race day rehearsal, so all our race kit, uh, the race bike, race wheels, and the, you know you just never train in that sort of stuff. You know it's all like top end, especially for the Olympics or Paralympics because it's all you know kind of like super duper stuff that you get that you get for that. And uh, this is that. And it, at that point, you're putting down a marker as, as to you know how fast you can go, or you know, or a marker for the games, you know, like in two weeks' time. And I remember we we got up and we rode, and it went pretty well. Well, I thought it went pretty well. And as we we're rolling around, trying you know, like trying to slow down to come off the track, I looked up at our coach Dan and and just sort of you know kind of went like. You know, how, how was that? Because there's no clock up or anything. So we didn't know, you know, that everyone's clapping and there's a dude on the microphone saying, oh, it's the Bain, Adam Duggleby, you know, it's like, they're going to be hopefuls and stuff. And you listen to this stuff and you're just kind of laughing. And, and Dan kind of gave me the thumbs up. And when we, when by the time we slowed down and rolled into track center, there was a bit of a bit of a buzz going on in the, in the track center through the coaching staff and support team. And it was just kind of like, oh, oh it must be some good news, you know, like so maybe, maybe some kits arrived we're waiting for or something like that. And we came back in. <laughs> And we've just broken the current world record. So we just smashed it by two seconds. Um, <laughs> you know, and, and it was funny because we rolled in and I said to Dan, how was that? And he just, he just said to me, 409. At that time, the current world record was 411. And that was set at altitude, you know, which is supposed to be stupid fast. So then you start to think, oh, maybe we've got a hope of getting a medal here at these games. You know, maybe this is you know, maybe, maybe we do know what we're doing, you know, it's, you know, two and a half years is a quick journey to go from being a, a rock climbing bum to being an elite, you know, kind of world-class athlete. Um, so yeah. And I, I remember the head coach just saying, like he, he walked over and was like, mate, that was a great ride boys. You know, well done. Yeah. That's absolutely fantastic. This goes no further. No one knows about this. I don't want you telling your wives, your girlfriends, family, no one knows about this. We can't let anyone know about this because, you know, obviously if the media, media get hold of that, you know, sort of, uh, you get a lot of attention, which is what you don't want. You know, you just want to be in your own bubble, focusing what you know on what you're doing, which is why you're in a holding camp, so they can keep the media at arm's length. Um, so yeah, it, it was really funny actually because I remember riding. We rode back to the hotel for lunch, and I rode out with one of our carers, one of the guys, massage guys and stuff, named Eamon, who's a, like he's an absolute legend. You know, he's he's been there, done it when it comes to biking. He's raced at a very high level himself, and he's just. He's one of those guys who doesn't all, like never really says a, never really says a lot, but his words come weighted. If you know what I mean, you know they're like when he when he talks, you listen. You know that's that's how it kind of works with Eamon. He, he never he never gives you a load of advice, but when he get you know when he's willing to give it, you listen. And uh, and Adam and I were riding along, sort of talking. You know, obviously we're sky high, we're absolutely flying. You know, we've just you know we've just ridden the fastest pursuit we've ever ridden in our lives, faster than anyone's ever gone before. And we're riding back for lunch and, you know, we're obviously talking shit and, you know, bigging ourselves up and stuff. And Eamon rode up next to me and just turned around and said, listen, kid, you've won fuck all yet. And, you know, that was it. And it's just like bubble burst. And, you know, and, and the thing was, he was absolutely right. You know, it was still two and a half weeks to go before we had to race. And a lot of things can happen in bike racing in two weeks, you know. So it was exactly what, you know, he read it perfectly. And it was exactly what I needed to hear. You know, we hadn't won a thing. We've done a time which no one knew about, and it didn't, and a, you know, in big scheme of things, it didn't really matter. You know, so the following day, you know, we had a horrific hill reps to do, and, you know, I did two extra hill reps. So it was really, I guess it really cemented into me, like, the work hasn't stopped yet. We haven't won anything yet. We need to keep, you know, like, I, I kind of thought at that point it was ours to lose. You know, it's like no one's ever gone quicker than this before that we know about in competition. So, you know, basically, if we keep doing everything that we've said we keep doing, we should win. And that was, you know, that was the way that we that that we looked at it. And you know, I remember on the day uh, warming up in the track centre and watching these times go, and like the Paralympic record went. So from uh, from London from 2020, which was four minutes 17, you know, that went down to four minutes 15, and it was a Dutch couple of Dutch guys, and you know, they're punching the air, new Paralympic record, and the crowd's going crazy. And I can just remember sitting there, and this is not an ego thing at all. It was just confidence because I knew what we could do. And I just remember turning, looking around to Adam and just saying, enjoy it while it lasts boys. Cause that, that's, you know, like, there's no way that's going to be the final time here. You know, we've, we've got some, you know, we've got an ace up our sleeves and, 
And then the the, the race before ours, um, there was a second Dutch bike who were who were amazing. They were really really good bike, and they they went four oh nine. So they went as quick as what we did in Newport. And I just I just re- I remember saying to Adam like, someone's bought their A game. That's good. You know we've got we've got a race on here. You know, and it was it was probably just what we needed. You know, we we ended up going a second quicker again and went four oh eight to to break their world record. And uh, you know, it was just like at that point, you know, you know, we were racing up against the Australian Kieran Modger, who was an absolute legend in the sport. You know, he was coming to the end of his that was his last race. Um, you know, he was a current world champion and just an incredible guy. He's, he's since lost his life in a tragic road accident, which is a real shame. Um, but you know, we were, so I was racing against Karen, who's the biggest star of the sport, and there's us, you know, these newcomers, and uh, yeah, and we um, so we smashed the world record, qualified fastest, so we're into a gold and silver ride off, you know. So we left the velodrome, and it didn't matter what happened in the final; we'd won a, you know, we got a medal, you know. So two and a half years earlier, we were kind of oh, the dreams to just become Paralympians and go to a games, to all of a sudden like, well, we've got a medal, you know, and. And it, it, it wasn't until we were warming up for the final ride that later that evening. And I turned around to Adam and I said, how are you feeling? And he goes, yeah, my legs feel amazing. And it's, it's the only time where Adam and I have ever got on the bike and both of us have said, both of us have said we feel amazing. Because as, as you can imagine as athletes, when you've got two of you on one bike, it's really hard to get both of you feeling absolutely pinging and in their top shape at the same time on the same day. Um, it's a really uh, it's a really hard thing to manage for the for the coaching staff to you know to two very different athletes and the way that we go about do things training wise and things to all of a sudden on that day they both need to be the best they've ever been and and you know I mean that, that's how I remember warming up and looking down at the numbers I was seeing on my power meter and they were just sky high I'd never seen numbers like them and I felt amazing you know and it was just like right this is this is awesome so. Uh, yeah, it's crazy. Like it's, it's it's just crazy to think back. Like that's you know, four four years ago now, just about. And um, yeah, it's, it still seems really surreal talking about it. You know, I just I still can't believe it. It, it kind of it happened, really. You know, it's, uh, I, I always think like stuff like that's not meant to happen to people like me. I'm just a normal dude. You know, and you find yourself sat on the back of a tandem, and all of a sudden you've got a world record and uh, and a gold medal, and it's a bit surreal, man. To be honest, you you kind of yeah, it's just. The most bizarre thing ever, you know. You can't the words. You can't just some that. Everyone goes, "Oh, to describe how it feels." And he's like, "Well, I can't. I don't. I, I don't have the vocabulary." You know, it's just, um, yeah, it's a crazy, crazy time. Yeah, it's awesome, mate. Awesome. Um, how do you, how do you manage to control your adrenaline before you step up that bike when you're ready to go? How do you manage to control your your emotions so you don't end up with like a flipping adrenaline? adrenaline dump at the most inopportune moment in the race yeah it's a um it's an interesting one that because there's there's i i find when i when i talk to people the most interesting thing for me is that point where for people who race or you know play rugby or you know race a car or something that point where you finish your warm-up and you are making your way to the start line and that and that that you know that period of time whether it's a couple of minutes, or maybe it's ten minutes, depending on what what the score is. Um, I find that fascinating because that that's where I think a lot of the time races are won or lost. You know, I mean, you can't you can't do anything in that in that uh, in that period to get better. You know, it's physically impossible, but you can do a, a, an awful lot of damage in your own head. To you know, which is the difference between having a great ride and having an absolute shocker. You know, and phys- the physiology of it is. There's no difference, you know. You feel how you feel. It's just a mental preparation in your head and what you go through. And I think for me, of up until Rio, I survived really well. I didn't have any any psych help at all. But my, I always looked back on, reflected on climbing the solo of El Cap, and thinking, well, no matter what happens here, I'm not going to die. You know, this is this is only four minutes long. This race, or this is only you know, half an hour or three hours or whatever race we were doing, you know, it was like, it's not like I'm going into six days and if I make a mistake, I'm going to kill myself. So I always kind of looked back and reflected on my on, on my kind of solo of El Cap thinking, well, Christ, that was the hardest thing I've ever done. So this is just riding a bike. Um, 
But, you know, a lot of stuff is, you know, like a lot of it, you hear a lot of athletes talk about, you know, staying focused on the process and not thinking about the outcome and, and all these sorts of things. And, yeah, and that's, that, you know, as, as much as cliche and, you know, people say it, it's, it's just the basic facts, you know. If you, if you think about everything you need to do and, you know, on the bike and, you know, for, for us, it was literally getting off the start line. You know, because because once you're going, as you know, one you know, in rugby, once the ball's kicked off, you're in you're an autopilot. You've trained hundreds and hundreds of hours to do whatever it is is about to happen. You know, you've you've worked all that, and in pursuiting, you know, there's no curveballs. You know exactly what you know, like like I said, you know, we've broken the world record. We knew exactly what we could do. All we had to do was replicate that ride. So if there are any doubts, it was the only worry that I had was that we didn't replicate it. You know, that something. It just something went, you know, didn't quite go to plan, and we um, and we kind of d- didn't quite deliver the performance that we could have delivered. And uh, so I guess that was the that was the only thing that I had in my head. But you know what? I, I mean, I remember sitting in the the dreaded start starting here in the seats before you have to go up. And and one thing I love, you know, like I'm sat there next to Adam. We've got a we've got a carer who's got a towel and a water or something that you never need. Like say, Eamon would be there to with the stuff. Uh, you know, they they don't say anything. You know, that's uh, they know this is your this is your space and not to not to speak to you and stuff. And you're you're going through your pre race kind of routine, whatever that is. Um, and I remember Dan coming over a coach and kneeling down. And his his only words and it was really funny. His only words in the qualifier were, "Right lads, you know what you've got to do. Let's go and do it." That was it. That was all he said. That was our big pep talk. That was our big motivator, you know, because he knew himself. He, he's not really a big man for words. And he knew himself that, you know, we, everyone knew what their jobs were. Everyone knew what we had to do. Let's just go and execute it how we know we can. So that was fine. Of course, that went really well. Later on that evening when we came back for the final, um, I remember walking back over to those seats. And I remember that the, the conversation in my head up until that point was like, well, I've got, I've got a Paralympic medal. So even if we lose this, I don't care, you know, because we've got a Paralympic medal. And I remember sitting down in that seat and having this kind of dialogue going, you have to care. Right. This is the you closest you'll become you, to winning a gold you, medal. You, oh, sorry. That, yeah, just cool. that, that key moment of emotion, it went blank. <laughs> you were on about, uh, you were talking about the uh, inner dialogue. You, you were having an inner dialogue with yourself. Yeah, yeah. So I was having this inner dialogue in my head about, well, I don't care if we win or lose because I've got a medal, you know, and a silver medal is bloody incredible. You know, two and a half years ago, I could have never dreamed of having a silver medal. Um, and if you would have given it to me, I would have taken it, you know, for sure. And then I remember sitting in the seat and I looked across at Adam and Adam was like deep in his own kind of, you know, kind of getting a psych on whatever he was doing. And I just remember this dialogue going on my head. It's like, Steve, you need to give a shit about this. This is the closest you'll ever come to a gold medal. It's just there. You know, so you need to get your ass in gear and make sure you you win this. And while this was happening, I hadn't realized, but Dan had come over, our coach who says nothing, and it just started jabbering like, blah, 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 blah. Just, I, I wasn't even listening to what he's saying. And I said to Adam afterwards, like, did you even listen to what Dan was saying? And he said, no, it's just rabbiting on like some old woman. It was just like crazy. And uh, yeah, so there was Dad going on. He was far more nervous standing on the side, giving us our time splits than what we were on the bike. You know, so it's just a really funny, funny thing where, you know, it's, it's um, yeah, the best part is when you get called up to the bike, and, you know, the bike's in the gate and you get to leave those seats behind. And, you know, and, and that I remember you, know, you stand up and take a deep breath and you start, you start walking towards the bike and you just think, yeah, this is, this is what it's all about. You know, this is, this is where you want to be. You know, you're on the biggest stage in the world. But, you know, with the with the biggest crowd in the world you've ever raced against, um, uh, raced in front of, sorry, and, you know, your family's up on the stands, and it's, um, yeah. And, uh, you know, but th- you're all aware of that, but that's not really having any effect, if, if that makes sense, on your head. You know, you're just like, right, okay, you know, when the countdown timer goes off at 10, I'm going to take a deep breath, you know, and then exhaling at 7, I'll take another deep breath, and when the, the beat goes at 5 with 5 seconds, I'm going to stand up, get back off the bike, you know, Adam's doing the same thing as me, and you know, so you're, you're back and ready to go. And then there's, you know, like at three, there's another deep breath. And then two, there's, you know, like I, I squeeze the bars and get my, you know, upper body really rigid and tight. And then with one, I stand on the pedal with as much power as I can, you know. So as soon as that gate release, you're going to shoot out of it. Um, 
So yeah, you, you know, you, you, all of these things you've got going on in your head. So you don't really, you know, like you, I could I could hear the crowd where our our you know they were like eighteen, eighteen to twenty five British folk, you know, all in a bunch on the side of the track, and I could I I could hear them every time we went past that side of the track screaming. But there's just this kind of yeah, you know, it's almost like white noise. You're there, and all you can really hear is your breath and your thoughts going on in your head, and then you just hear this noise that you 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 know they're your people, but you can't you can't pick anyone out, or you don't you don't know you can't hear them, you don't know what they're shouting. You just hear this noise, this wave of noise as you go flying past them. Um, so yeah, it's a kind of um, it's a really it's a really weird headspace. Oh, you, you you kind of learn a lot. Yeah. You- yeah, you you went again. Kind of weird headspace. Yeah, um, uh, it does fascinate me the the way different people prepare for stuff like that. Now, again, I never competed at anything like your level. I did some again some military stuff, your usual stuff. If you're decent at running or something, you're your kid, right? But I and oh, and even the park, you know, park run, even the park runs now. Mm-hmm. I go and do them sometimes, and I get the same feelings when I was, when I was competing when I was younger. And <clears throat> it's like I get nerves. There's nerves there, but I'm. It's they're not. They're not nerves because I want to do. Because I'm worried about how well I'm going to do. They're nerves because I know this is going to be hideously hard. If I know how competitive I am, you know, I know I'm just going to be. I'm going to so much pain, but at the same time, I just want. I want the gun to go. I want whatever it is it's the trigger. I want that to go because I know as soon as that happens, as you were saying there, it's, you switch off and you're going to. You're on autopilot. And you and you king yourself, mm. and maybe there's some like tactics in there, maybe some pacing in there, depending on what you're doing. But one one thing that's always fascinated me is that that build up. And I'm a fan of UFC, right? Uh, mixed martial arts. And what I love about that, and probably similar to other sports, what I love about the mixed martial arts, which is sport in itself, you get to see all the different build ups that people adopt, the way they get ready to go mm. in and, in this case, fight. And some of them are just calm and they'll just walk in. You know, they walk out from the dressing room, they'll walk in, and then they've got two minutes in the in the octagon um, or ring if boxing. They've got two minutes then in front of their op- opponent. Some of them be going, you know, punch themselves in the chest, screaming. Others are just completely silent. Did you did you ever see anything? Did, was it pretty much the same right, other cyclists? If you ever saw that in their, their build up to it, is it is it sort of common across the sport that it's sort of relaxed calm you're in your own bubble or did people adopt very different approaches to their mental state of going into that right before the the races yeah so i think yeah yeah like like ufc you know everyone's different and you you know you hope you hope when you get to that level you've kind of got got that side of things pretty well dialed you know i could imagine you know i mean the, these guys that are stepping into a cage to you know kind of go into combat is um you know and potentially get hurt is you know i mean it, it, it's pretty hardcore for sure you know and it's you know the nerves and stuff are probably no different to what i'm feeling when i'm when i'm about to get up like yeah i'm not i'm not i'm not going to fight anyone but That's you know it's, it's still they, that they same see it. They see it as a sport. I, I, they, yeah, yeah. They, they'll see it the same way as you. They just go into sport, and as soon as the bell goes, it's just, that's right. It's, you know, it, it is it's pretty irritating what they do, but it is it is the same thing, like you say. It's the same process. It's just you yeah, can yeah. see it. You can, you can see what people are doing. Yeah. And, you know, you, you see that the same, you know, with some of the big track sprinters that, you know, that we've got, you, um, you know, you see them get into the gate, and, yeah, they start thumping their chest or, you know, like fist bumping their coach and, you know, he slaps them really hard on the back or whacks them across the face or, you know, there's all sorts of different things. You know, and people just need to get into that zone, a, you know, a very, a very different way. You know, I mean, it's really funny because when the countdown starts in cycling, certainly in track cycling, you know, there's a, there's a beep at 10 seconds to let you know there's 10 seconds to go and there's another, and then when it gets to five, it, it beeps down, you know, every, every second. But, you know, it's a really funny thing because when you walk out and there's, you know, there might be music going, there might be lights on as you get on the bike. And then as soon as the, uh, as soon as the, the 10 second beep goes, the whole crowd goes quiet. And you, you could literally oh. pass and everyone would hear. You know, I'm getting it's, nervous it's, now. I'm getting nervous now. Yeah, yeah. It. It, it, it's crazy. You know, I'd, I'd, honestly, I'd prefer it if everyone's just kept on screaming and stuff like that because it's almost like, you know, just like someone clicks their fingers, that, that beep goes off and someone clicks their fingers and it's dead silent. You know, it's like, and then, you know, and literally it's just, 
you you and your breath, no one's talking, no one's saying anything, and you, it's just you know, and you and, and and you're there about to be shot out of a gun. So uh, yeah, it's amazing. It's a, it's an amazing is, place to be. Is your 2016 is your 20, are your 2016 races on YouTube? Uh, the pursuit is yeah they they um they never filmed any of the road racing or the time trialing, um so uh, yeah which is a, which is a bit of a shame really they they just didn't have the budget for it you know unfortunately just the the way that Rio ran um but yeah the the um the the pursuit finalists the qualifiers not on there but the finalists where we race against the Dutch guys um which is uh yeah kind of it, it, it's crazy watching it now because you know I can. I can vividly remember in the final, there was one turn, I think it was like turn three as you come back onto the home straight. And there was like, there must have been like a burger van or something on that turn. And I remember every time I came around, you could smell this like burning meat and it was horrific. You know, you're just like, you know, as you can imagine, you know, your heart rate's at 180 beats. You, you know, you're like, you're, you feel like you want to die. And you're just getting these lungful, you know, this lungful of like bad smoke and, you know, it's, it's just, you know, you, you know what that's like. If, even if you're running or something and a diesel engine goes past and you're just like, oh, coughing up your lungs. This is like right at the elite level of sport and you, just, you can't get away from it. And you know every lap, you've got to go through it again. It's horrible. But, what, yeah, what it's, on you, it's on there. What is your, what does your heart rate hit when you're, when you're at peak? Um, about, I think, what, 192, I think. You know, so I'm, yeah, 42 years old, so yeah, 192. I, I haven't hit that for a while, to be fair. But, uh, yeah, that, that was actually in a lab test, um, which is pretty, pretty grim, as you can imagine. Um, yeah, right, 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 right till you explode and see what happens. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> awful. <laughs> I'm sure these guys, like, these physiologists are just like sickos, really. They just like seeing people suffer really badly because some, some of the tests you have to do are just awful. But, yeah, it's, they reckon there's science behind it, but I'm not sure there is. It's crazy in it, right? The, the human body, as if the human body is, it, it's the only reason it can hit those peaks, right? It's designed to, to that's for that's for survival, that's evolutionary survival, that's getting away from danger, right? And that's why it's so fucking painful because everything goes into it, everything goes into it, right? And we do it for fun. You go, let's create sports. <laughs> Push ourselves yeah. to the absolute peak. It's mental. Mental. I don't, why do we do it ourselves? Why do we do it ourselves? I wonder. If, yeah. I wonder if sports came about. I should look that up. How was sports born out? Oh, it was. It was to simulate combat, wasn't it? That's where sport came from. Yeah, didn't it? I think so. Yeah, I think yeah, so. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Bloody idiots. Mm. Yeah. Idiots. Will, yeah. You, will you ever go back to climbing? Yeah, I think so, mate. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I'm pretty single-minded. So while the cycling things going on, I can't really do too much else but you know climbing was a massive part of my life and a huge passion and you know I, I when I came back from LCAP and I pretty much went straight into a British cycling talent ID day trial thing so um and I knew from that from that day onwards if I really you know I like I said I had two and a half years well it was probably three years at that point um when I first started with British cycling and I knew if broke up they just quit everything and you know just fully focus on riding a bike and that was it, you know, because, yeah, it's, when, you know, climbing is amazing and, and when the weather's good, you know, if I, I think if I was still climbing, I'd eat, happily sack off a turbo session on my, uh, you know, an interval session on the turbo to go and dangle off a rock face. It'd be far more impressive, but I don't, I don't think, uh, I don't think I'd be winning any medals if I had that approach to uh, my sport. So, yeah, it's just one of those things, isn't it? You know, like everyone talks about sacrifices and compromise and stuff like that. And that, it really pisses me off when I hear athletes say, oh, I've sacrificed so much to win this medal. And, you know, it's all bollocks. You've made choices. You know, people around you have sacrificed a lot for your selfishness because that's all it comes down to. You know, I mean, you know, if you're an athlete and you've, you've won a gold medal and you're standing there saying, oh, I've sacrificed so much for this. It's like you need it. You need your, you need your head red and you need to need to look at the people around you who have, have followed in your wake and been cut aside or pushed away so you can do whatever it is you want to do. But, it's incredibly selfish and, you know, to bring, to bring people into that journey is a really, really hard thing to do. You know, I mean, my wife's been absolutely amazing since I've started cycling and, you know, and she's, she's just said, as, as long as I'm a part of it, you know, if you can make me a part of it somehow that, you know, that that's all I'm asking. And, you know, and, and I've managed to do that, but it's been really, really hard. And, you know, the amount of time she said, oh, should we go and do this this weekend? It's like, no, nah, can't do that. Not doing that. Can't do that. I'll be too knackered or, you know, and, 
And certainly in the run into the games and stuff, I was just an absolute zombie. You know, I was useless. I couldn't do anything. You know, she asked me to wash the dishes, and two hours later, I'd. And then. Like a protein shake or something stupid. You know, it's just. You're just so fatigued and so nailed all the time. It's just like. You know, all of those, you know, kind of, like if I lived on my own, I would have been absolutely useless. You know, the house would have been an absolute tip and would have been dreadful. Um, but, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very fortunate. You know, most athletes are. They, they wouldn't get to where they got to without their other halves or the parents or, you know, the family around them. But we're certainly pretty quick to cut them off when we need to because, you know, we need to focus on what we need to focus on. It's super selfish, but, you know, it's just... Um, if people are happy with that and stuff and they, they can enjoy the ride. And, you know, I mean, I've got, I've got three Paralympic medals somewhere in the house and, uh, well, only two because I gave my brother one, but, you know, I've, I've got those medals, but there's a lot of people, you know, that deserve a medal equally as big and as round and as shiny as what mine is, you know, like from the, you know, not only the staff of British cycling and the, the mechanics and the F and C coach and the physiologist and, you know, the physio keeps my body going to, you know, all of, all of my friends and family who just literally lose Steve for, you know, six months of the year when I'm prepping for big events and don't hear from them, don't have time to call people, nothing. And then, you know, all of a sudden it's like, you know, it kind of finishes up and you pick up. And I was like, hey, man, how are you like it was yesterday? You know, like you've ignored me. You've missed my wedding. You've missed my birthday. You've missed this and missed that. And it's just kind of like, oh, soz, mate. Yeah, sorry, I was doing my own thing. You know, but hey, I've got this medal. Isn't this cool? <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it's an interesting it's an interesting observation. It does. It's like you know you you obviously got world records. You got you got um, gold medal, um, uh, and you know no one else could do what you and you and um, Adam do. It's Adam, isn't it? Adam. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What you and Adam do. But I think the the reality is you alluded to it there. For for anyone at the, at the peak of their game, to get to that point, it does take an in inverted commas a special group of people around them, that support network. You know, just to be that emotional support to to actual doing things in your life that you need doing support. And I was talking to, I was talking to the the captain of the ladies Welsh rugby team, Suan Lillycrap, uh, Suan, not Suan, Sh- Suan. Um, a couple of weeks back, I was I was doing a, a, an interview with her on leadership um, for a different series I'm putting together, and she she said the same thing. I mean, she's she's a captain of Wales and she's a head of rugby at Swansea Uni, and she's like, you know, my family don't see me. I'll I'll mm. I'll, I'll be out the door at six a.m. to go and coach the team or be you know do the team training, and then I'm at uni, and then in the evening I'm I'm coaching rugby at. at uh, uh, I'm coaching rugby, you know, whatever. And basically, the whole day, all, all like all her family see of her is laundry getting dropped off. She gets it back washed, making food prep. But there's, you know, there's no. It's just that it is that selfishness. But at the same time, the acceptance of people around you that it's a, it's sort of, it's in, it's impressive how people let it happen. <laughs> people let people be bastards. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. It's um. Yeah, I, th- I think that's you know part of the thing when you you know when you do win or you have a result. I think I think part of it is just you know for me those um, you know the the medals that we you know that we won at the games were you know part of that is just relief. You know, there's been such a such a massive amount of support to to get Adam and I on the start line in the greatest shape of our lives, and it's just kind of it's nice to repay that with the performance that. Every you know everyone can be proud of it, and, and you know we've all come away with a gold medal, you know. And it's yeah, I think as a um, you know, I think I pretty much went around the whole team and and you know all the support guys and had my photo taken with them wearing the medal, and they're like, no, no, you wear it, you've won it, and it's like we've won it, you know. It's like this isn't you know, yeah, great. I I, I get to uh, I get to take it home, but you know, I'm under no illusions that you know without the input you've had. It wouldn't be around my neck, you know, be around someone else's. So, uh, yeah, I think I think you've got to stay really grounded. And I, I, I try, you know, I mean, I'm pretty lucky because I've got some pretty savage mates. And, uh, you know, if I, if I get ahead of myself, they, they remind me that I'm just a dickhead. So, uh, so you know, which which is, you know, it's, it's, 
I'm I'm pretty good, but sometimes it's you know it's kind of it's kind of needed. You know, when you're when you're off to meet the queen or something at a weekend, and people are just like, "Oh, listen to you, you twat." You know, it's kind of yeah. So it's kind of funny, but yeah, I, I I like to stay I like to stay pretty grounded with you know. I always used to love to come back from racing when I lived in Scotland and mow the lawn as my first chore when I got home. Yeah, it was just kind of one thing to just be like. Yeah, mate, you might have gone and won a race in Europe somewhere or whatever, but you've come back and you've still got a lawn to mow. You know, you're just a normal <laughs> dude, mate. You can't afford to have someone mow your lawn just yet, pal. And, you know, and, it, and it's kind of always stayed like that. And I've always tried to be, you know, like I always say anything I do, like I'm just I'm just a normal guy who's who just works really hard. You know, like I'm not super talented at anything I do. I, I've just got a ridiculously stubborn ethic, you know, ethical head that, you know, refuses to, give up or, or what probably more wants to see what I can achieve, you know, what, what I'm capable of achieving. And I think when you achieve a couple of things at quite a high level, you, you can't give yourself any excuses. You know, you think anything you turn your, turn your head to or hand to, you just think, well, I know if I work hard enough, I can make it, I can make it happen. Um, you know, regardless of uh, disability or, or, you know, I've never done this for 10 years or everyone else is better than me now. It's, um, yeah, I've, I've I've always been fascinated, like you know, like you say, with the, with the human body. It's our it's our greatest asset we get given, and so so many of us neglect it, you know, and what we can do with it. It's such an amazing thing to have, um, you know. And I I just you know I, I love learning about what my body can do, and you know, I certainly know there's a lot of things it can't do. It's rubbish at things, but um, you know, it's just one of those one of those things. Yeah, you know, I always say to people, you know, when you win a when you win a gold medal, everyone thinks. It's a bit like Bradley Wiggins, I think, or Chris Hoy. Everyone thinks when you win a gold medal, every race you do, you're going to win. You know, like when Bradley Bradley Wiggins won the Tour de France, it's like everyone thinks every race he rides from there on out, he's going to win. You know, like Geraint Thomas, same thing. It's, um, you know, and as, as a bike rider, you lose far more races than you're ever going to win. You know, that's that's just the way it goes. Um, but it's just important about trying to win the, win the ones that count, you know, get go all in when it really matters. You know, so the last three years or something haven't you know i mean adam and i have done done pretty well but um you know it was this year we were we were both all in for one last time to you know to make sure we we defended those you know those titles because you know we've won world titles we've lost world titles in the last two years which is pretty hard to swallow but you know it's, it's just it's one of those things you you got to you got to take the good with the bad and you got to shake people's hands we lost our pursuit world record in uh, january this year in canada you know we watched a bike absolutely annihilate our record take it from four four minutes, eight seconds down to four minutes and three seconds. An incredible ride. And we were there to watch it. And we had to race those guys in the final, knowing they'd gone way quicker than we'd ever gone. Um, you know, but you've still got to you still got to walk over at the end of the day and shake the hand and say, that was unbelievable. You know, and you know, one one thing that is probably the the I, I always say my or our our world record was far I'm far prouder of our world record than I am of the gold medal. And we won both on the same day. Um, but I think, you know, as, as we learn a few days later, I mean, we had, we had a pretty bad ride in the time trial and we still won, you know, so we, we were the best of the worst riders on that day. Um, you know, where the pursuit, everything went absolutely perfect. Like it was textbook execution. Um, so it just showed me that, you know, like you can still win a, win a gold medal on a bad day, but you can't break world records on a bad day. You know, you you have to be, you know, incredibly going incredibly well, and you're in you know going faster than anyone's ever gone before is an incredible thing to do, and so you know that that's and, and I think when I retire from cycling, um, that will still be my greatest achievement. You know, we've lost that world record, but setting a world record and raising the bar on everyone else is is an incredible thing, and it was incredible the amount of our peers that came up after that race. Um, between the qualifier and the final to come up to shake our hands to congratulate us was was phenomenal. You know, they're like they're thirty tandems racing that day, uh, in the in the pursuit and the qualifier. And you know, there were probably twenty of them that came over afterwards and just said that was a phenomenal ride. That's unbelievable. You know, and that's you want the respect of your peers, don't you, when you compete? That's what it's all about. You, you want to, you know, you want to be the best bike, but you want to be that guy who's, you know, can shake hands and at the end of it and say, well done, whether you've won or lost. And, you know, it's, it's great to be in the position when you win, but it's also great to be in the position when you lose to walk over and congratulate people on how, you know, how amazing their ride was. And, you know, I remember standing in track center watching 
the Polish bike break our record. And it was just, I remember halfway through the race and I looked at Adam and said, this is phenomenal. Like, this is an absolutely unbelievable ride. They're going to annihilate our record here. And yeah, and they did, you know, and it hurt for a couple of weeks. Don't get me wrong. You know, it's pretty, um, you know, I guess the, it, it hurts the ego a bit to be like, oh, we're not the fastest bike in the world anymore. But, you know, it, it's just, uh, I guess that just, um, I guess I always thought in my head when I retired, I wanted to retire as a world champion and world record holder. So I, I, I got a bit of work to do in the next year, which is, uh, you know, it kind of fuels the fire a bit, doesn't it? Do you um do you do you worry much about the when your site completely goes or do you uh, block it out? Because I mean you're gonna, obviously you're gonna be able to keep cycling. Um, well, how do you how do you deal with that side of things, Steve? Yeah, it's a good question, mate. I think in the early days um, it terrified me. It was really really frightening. You know, the thought of going blind, doing what I do, not being able to do what I do, was a really kind of scary thing. Um, now I've kind of got my head around it a bit more, and I look at more as uh, as just the next the next chapter, the next adventure. You know, it's like I do all this incredible stuff, you know, with with not very much vision. God, imagine what that's going to be like trying to do that with no vision. You know, that's going to be fucking exciting, isn't it? Excuse my French, but yeah. So I, th- I think I've just it's what your mind your mind works funny, and it's all about reframing things. And yeah, don't get me wrong, I'm uh, you know like I guess honestly, I, I mean I don't want to go blind. You know, I mean I. I I say I couldn't think of anything worse, but I, I probably could. But um, it's just one of those things. I think mentally it's how you, how you deal with it. Like, you know, I remember when I lost my driver's license and got told I had this degenerative eye condition. And I know how that made me feel for six months. And I was pretty pretty depressed and pretty down about it. And I don't, I, I don't ever want to – I guess I don't ever want to go back, be back in that position where you're that upset about what's going on. You know, there's, there's it's just – it's not worth it. You know, the life's too short as it is to be, you know, freaking out about something you can't control. It's just a case of, right, okay, so this is happening. So what, what can I do? What can I do now? How, how can I make what I want to do work? And I think if you're open-minded, you can, you know, you can make anything work. Um, you know, there's always some nutter out there who wants to climb a mountain with a blind guy because that's, that's a challenge for them, you know, or, you know, race a tandem with a blind guy on the back or whatever, you know, there's, I think if you're willing to ask for help, I think the biggest key is being able to accept the fact you need help and being willing to ask for it. Um, the, the, the first six months, I think, of when I got my diagnosis and, you know, I'd had my driver's, I lost my driver's license straight away. I, I didn't want to ask people for, you know, to get in the car and, you know, to give me a lift somewhere. And, you know, that, and that's kind of where I started riding my bike a lot more. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think, I think once you, once you get over that and you realize people are, more than willing to help and you know it's fine to be independent and you know I was, I was a pretty I guess pretty arrogant young bloke who was pretty confident and and stuff and it you know and to admit that you got something wrong with you wasn't probably wasn't the coolest thing but you know once, once I got my head around that and it's like well you can't control it it's happening to you so you know it's one of those things you always got two choices you can sit on a couch and cry about it and be down and you know get to the places where you might think about taking your life because it's gone not gone your way or or you can um you know you can you can go and see what's out there and what you still can do and hey you know the the all parts worked all pretty you know worked out all right for me really so e- even when that day comes where i do you know i get to the point where I, I i do need to walk with a cane or get a dog or you know that that sort of stuff it's just you know i guess it's just going to be keeping you know making sure I'm still doing what I can do. And, you know, the one thing I've thought of already is like open water swimming. You know, you, you can't hurt yourself too badly in open water swimming, can you, if you're blind? You know, if you've got someone kind of telling you which way to swim, unless you're swimming to a jetty, of course, that'd suck. But, um, you know, I, 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 I think, you know, so I'm already already kind of thinking of things that would inspire me, you know, to, to, um, to carry on, you know, this kind of outdoor lifestyle and this kind of adventurous lifestyle that I... I love living, you know, I'm really passionate about being outdoors and having adventures. And yes, yeah, so I think, I think now I just, you know, I, I looked to, you know, there's a blind guy who's uh, Jesse, who's just climbed the old man of Hoy, which is phenomenal. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's plenty of people that are blind out there doing incredible stuff and it's just looking for them to, for inspiration. And, you know, I may not be able to do it as, as big as I used to or as fast as I used to or technical as I used to, but Hey man, if you're still out there doing it, you know, I don't, I think now that 
I'm kind of uh, I'm kind of a point now where I, I you know, when you're young, when you're a young bloke, you kind of feel like you have got loads of stuff to prove, don't you? You know, like you prove you're really strong, or you prove you're tough, or you're the coolest guy, or whatever. And I, I just I don't have that anymore. You know, I mean. I think after uh, I think after climbing Hellcat kind of changed me mentally in terms of like well, I, you know, I got nothing to prove. You know, I mean, I climbed a solid Hellcat. You know, it's like whoa. Um, so yeah, and you know, and then and then you go on and you, you know you, you you know you you win gold medals and stuff like that, which is you know like I don't walk around telling everyone I've got gold medals and carry them in my pocket and stuff, but it's you know. It, it, it's kind of nice when people don't know that and they treat you as just this guy Steve down the meeting. Oh, yeah, you seem like a pretty cool dude. And then you'll have a conversation with them, you know, a week later or something. And someone goes, no fucking way. I didn't know you, you've got gold medals and you're an MBE. And it's like, well, does it matter? Does it change anything? You know, I'm just like, I'm just, I'm, like I said, I'm just a dude. Um, so yeah, it's kind of, yeah, it's, it's, it's a funny one, mate. I, I don't know. I just think you gotta, you gotta try and stay positive even, even when it's, you know, sometimes it's challenging to do that, isn't it? But, you know, I mean, I think it, I think if we can always look for what we can do and not what we can't, I think that's the that's the most important thing. Um, yeah. You mentioned earlier um, about, you know, if you can't, if you can't do anything about it, why, why worry about it? And I think that that's a really alien, that's a really alien attitude for people, for a lot of people to, so well, understand and take on, and I think it's an, and it's an attitude and understanding that's born out of extreme circumstance. I I I learned that when I was serving in in you know just on the, the different tours I did. You obviously learned it in your extreme circumstance that you're in. You know, faced with the prospect of completely losing your sight and 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 mean and that positive mindset yeah and going forward. And I think I, I've tried to, I've tried to articulate that message to my kids as they've been growing up. It's just like look. look why worry about it? But sort of until this conversation, I, I haven't done it properly. So thank you, right? So, so it's like, why worry about it? That, why worry about it if you can't do anything? If you can't do anything about it, what's the point? I, I think I need to take a stage a stage further with them because it's because saying why worry about it if you can't do anything about it, no point in stressing over it. That doesn't mean that doesn't mean you don't plan for it. Okay, mm. it, it just means you. It's also an advantage. You know something's going to happen. You've got knowledge. You know it's going to happen. I cannot change that thing. Could be a good thing. Could be a bad thing. I can't change it. How can I best deal with that situation? Absolutely plan for it, but don't stress over what is happening because, like you said, you can't change mm. it. Nothing you can do about it in the world. Yeah, yeah. Mm. I think a good way of looking at that is, you know, if uh, if it's something I worry about it, just like, well, wh- why? Why are you worried about it? Talk, you know, just talk through it. What, you know, what's the concern? Or is it, you know, and generally, I guarantee you, if, if people are a hundred percent honest with themselves, generally it comes back to self embarrassment. You know, generally everything will come back to, what if I fail? You know, am, am I going to look like a fool in front of all my mates? You know, uh, you know, am am I going to be ripped to shreds on social media or you know what the, you know, but I and and certainly in my experiences the things where i'm the most nervous about actually i guess our our cap's a bit different because that you know that's was a bit kind of fear of death as well um which is a bit extreme but you know i think when it you know when it all comes to bike race it's like well if i don't win is every guy gonna take the piss out of me you know and if, if i don't achieve what i set you know set the goals for myself of have I failed and then I'm a failure, you know, and it's, it's, I, I think that's what, that's what it's, yeah, it's overall saying, oh, don't worry about it. If, if you can't control it, don't worry about it. That's about as good as someone saying to you when I say, oh, I'm a bit nervous about this race. And they say, don't worry, you'll be fine because it's you. You know, it's like, well, that's no bloody use at all. But people don't have, people don't know. They don't have the vocabulary to say. They don't have the, you know, the, the, it's, it's just, that's, that's just the, polite way of saying I haven't got a clue what to say right now so I'm going to say you'll be fine you know and I've I've found myself saying it to friends who were going to do something so ah don't worry mate you'll be fine and then I'll say clock with say sorry mate that doesn't help at all does it yeah I, I really you know I understand why you're nervous or you know what you're worried about that's cool but you know why are you worried about it? And, and and if it's fear of failure um what what have you got to be worried about you know it's it's kind of so, so what you fail, you know, and, and what, you know, I read a great quote the other day where it said, we, um, we don't really make mistakes, mistakes make us. And it couldn't be further from the truth, you know, and I've always learned, 
a lot more from losing races than I have ever from winning them. You know, and that's it's just a building up, like you say, building up that kind of level of experience where you get to a point where you think, actually, if I lose here, what, what, you know, you almost get to the point where it's like, what have I got to lose? And when you get into that mindset, you're winning. doesn't matter the result. Because if you can go into a race and think, well, I've got nothing to lose here. I've done everything I can prep. The bike's absolutely flying. Adam's in, you know, he's in a good headspace. So, hey, what have we got to lose? We go out, we, you know, we can't control the result. But what we can control is giving it 110% on the bike. And if we do that right, there's a probably, there's a pretty good chance we'll win. And if we don't win, fair play to the guys who beat us. You know I mean? They're just, they're just better. And that's okay. You know, it's, it's good to lose. You need the balance. You need that yin and yang. You need, you need to, you know, I think the problem with young people today is it's such a, um, everything's happened so quickly. Everything's instant gratification, isn't it? You know, people turn up now and get medals for attending races, not winning them, attending them. And, you know, although that's lovely and it's a really lovely environment to be in, that's not life, you know, in life there's winners and there's losers. And, you know, and we all need to understand that it's okay to be on both sides. Yeah, it's great to win, but it's great to lose as well. You know, it, it keeps you grounded. It keeps you from not being an asshole. You know, I mean, the, the, one of the one of the best experiences I had, right, was after after Rio. We came back from Rio, so we had all the success in Rio. And the next three weeks after the games is pretty cool. You get invited to lots of cool stuff, um, and there's lots of cool stuff happening. And every time you go to one of these events, there's always someone who you know standing at this standing at meeting you with a clipboard to tick your name off and tell you how wonderful you are and amazing. They don't even know who you are. They've got no clue. You've got a gold medal. That's all they know. They've just told to look after you because you're a VIP. This guy's a gold medalist or this guy's a world record or a gold MBE or whatever it is, you know. And so you go into all these places and there's always people telling you how amazing you are. You know, it's just like, oh my God, you're so amazing. It's, you know, it's kind of gets to the point where you're like, you don't even know why. I could be a complete prick for all you know. I could be the most miserable, rude, arrogant person you would have ever met. And because my name's in one particular column on the sheet, you have to make sure, you know, that I feel good about myself. And I can see, like, that was a really eye-opener thing for me. I can see why, you know, like, footballers, film stars, rock stars, all these guys get way, way bigger than who they really are. You know, because they just surround themselves by these people that constantly tell them that, that, that you know, are like God, you know, and, and, and you just, you, start, you know, you, you can very easily, it's a very slippery slope to start believing what people tell you, you know, and that's where I think it's really important to have some really good mates around that. You know, like I say, you're still a ginger dickhead, mate. You know, I don't care if you've got a gold medal or an NBA, you met the queen, who cares, mate? You're still Steve, and I knew you when you weren't all of those things, and you're still a dick. You know, and that's, yeah. I, I think that's really important. You know, you have to, you have to stay grounded and you have to, you know, and, and also you have to realize other people don't have these opportunities. You know, I'm very fortunate to have been given these opportunities and, you know, not, not everyone gets them. And so going and flaunting it in front of people is, is, is an incredible thing to do or, a, you know, or a, or, a, or a big thing to do. I'm not, I'm not interested now. In I'm, in, I'm interested in people and the stories they've got to tell and, and, you know, what, what they've done, you know what I mean? The amount of times I get asked to, if, if I take a gold medal somewhere, which is very rare these days, you know, oh, can you wear it for a photo? It's like, nah, I've, I've worn that medal enough. I've, I've worn it the one time I needed to wear it, which was on the podium. How about I let you wear it? Oh, I can't wear that. I didn't win it. It's like, I don't care about that. The beauty of having a medal is giving it to someone, putting it in their hand and watching them just like, you just watch their mind explode. You know, they, they feel the weight of it. And they just like that. You can see all of their dreams happening in their head. And certainly kids, you can just see their eyes go golden and they light up. And it's just, you know, half the time they just start spilling verbal diarrhea about how they're going to win it, which is amazing. You know, it's absolutely amazing. Um, you know, that, that's the true power. You know, winning, winning it's great. Being able to put it in people's hands and give it to them so they can touch it and feel it is the best thing in the world. You know, it's the best thing ever. Um, it's a proper, you know, that that's a privilege. You know, that is one of, you know, may, maybe the biggest privilege I'll ever have in my life to be able to put that medal in a kid's hand. It's pretty cool. It's pretty cool, man. It's very cool, mate. You're absolutely right. It's very cool to to be inspiring. You know, to be an inspiring individual. We got to we got to start wrapping it up. Um, anything else you want to mention before we go? Your, your website, stevebaymbe.com, right? That's the one. Yeah. Yeah, 
so there's a bit of a uh, bit of a blog that runs on that. Um, I'm I'm a terrible writer, so I'm not a, I'm not. I'm not even going to say I'm a writer because that'll that'll insult writers. Um, but yeah, I, I, I like trying to write. Um, you'll see how I failed English so dismally when I was at school. But uh, yeah, so I write a bit on that. There's a few there's a few pictures up on that and a bit of you know films and content and stuff on that. But most of the stuff I do is on Instagram, really. You know, I'm pretty uh, I'm I'm pretty uh, pretty pretty prolific on the old Insta. So that that's the same handle, Steve Bay MBE. So um, yeah, if people want to follow the journey. That's that's way to stay up, up to date I suppose there you go mate I've really enjoyed talking to you <laughs> right on mate. And, uh, it's been a pleasure when this is done we'll align our calendars so you can have a beer we'll have a beer when you're not training yeah that's, yeah, yeah that sounds good man. <laughs> at, the, at the moment there's plenty of beers going down I tell you <laughs> <laughs> yeah cool listen stay safe good luck right on cheers you man cheers Take care. Man,